earlier. So those are some of the reasons why groups may fail to detect it. Therefore, we look for other footprints of XMRV infection in unmanipulated plasma. So the first thing we did was a direct isolation of plasma by immune precipitation using a GOAT anti-Zeno MLV antibody. We have Sandy Rossetti in, um, had, had studied these family of viruses for decades and she had a box of antibodies that we characterized against in all of our cells. And this antibody was particularly good at immune precipitation and one of the few that actually could. We used a, a GOAT gag monoclonal after we blotted it to show gag proteins in several of the patients, both P12 and P30, could be directly immune precipitated in the blood um, of unmanipulated plasma, suggesting um, that it's a footprint of infection is to look for viral RNAs and actual proteins uh, in the blood. So we next wanted to look at another footprint, and that is um, an inflammatory cytokine signature, as we've heard a lot about this morning. And what Vinny Lombardi did here is he took 156 XMRV, MRV-infected patients and 140 normal controls and found a highly significant dysregulation, both upregulation shown in red and downregulation shown in blue, of 10 cytokines and chemokines. He did this in a multiplex format on a Luminex platform where we screened everything without bias. Interestingly, this signature is, is very highly similar to some that Sandy Rossetti had seen in mouse models of neurodegenerative diseases in MLV viruses and similar to what Frank Rossetti showed in ATL patients, that is patients infected with HTLV1, another retrovirus. So, the next thing, this, this would suggest an innate immune response. So we next wanted to show is there an adaptive immune response to the virus. So we look for antibodies. Now we look for envelope antibodies, and this is the original work in the science paper. And we did, Sandy had a cell line that expressed the spleen focus forming virus envelope, which is a polytropic, xenotropic-like envelope. It's actually a defective virus, but the envelope is, is very highly similar, <laughs> particularly in the end terminus to XMRV. So it it's expressed on these cells when you do fluorescence activated cell sorting with a patient plasma diluted 1 to 100. You see if you reacted against the non-expressing cell line, you don't see any activity. But if it, as in uh, fluorescent units, when you look at the cell line expressing envelope, you see high, high levels of envelope expressed on all the cells. And we could compete this back with both the protein and the an monoclonal antibody. So then Rachel Bagney um, at the NCI was developing a ELISA format assay, and she did the receiver operator characteristics of all the proteins and found that the surface unit, the transmembrane, and the capsid were really the most antigenic proteins, in fact, the only ones that were really antigenic. When she used a training set of 39 of our patients, she found um, reactivity in 34 of those 39 against these proteins. The major um, antigenic site was the surface unit, as suggested by our original study. So importantly, in the control, she found high, um, 10 out of 77, which is a high level, and this was thought to be due to the high background because the surface unit expressed in baculovirus as they had it was quite unstable. So we wanted then to develop... Um, uh, other antibody testing in a Western blot format. So what uh, Vinny Lombardi and Svetlana Kobolina in the lab did was they um, cloned, they use expression clones generated um, to amplify various regions of the envelope protein. So as I said, the N-terminus is very highly similar. So they took an N-terminus clone um, here, and you can see just the expression that they got good expression of these uh, regions, and they, we looked to see if it could be reactive in patients' plasma. So what you see here is the sera of some, or plasma of some of the patients actually react to that N-terminal portion of the envelope very well, suggesting, I, I didn't mention, but the expression on the cell surface in the original paper suggested the epitope was a confirmational epitope, and that may be why when we try to put it in a LISA format, uh, we fail. But here you could see that that may have retained that confirmation because at least the N-terminal domain, which is very highly similar, has reactivity, whereas the red circles below show patients without reactivity to that um, envelope um, protein. 
So next we wanted to do the whole virus and see we've got several assays which detect activity, reactivity against the envelope protein, which is the most antigenic in this family of viruses. So we wanted to ask, could we detect multiple reactivities which strengthen the association? So we took, in the left lane we see here a purified viral lysate that was uh, prepared um, from 22RV1 cell on at the NCI, and they gave us this lysate. In the middle we express, we we ran the recombinant envelope protein I just showed you, and then we combined the two at the end in order to see if we could pick up additional reactivities. In HTLV1, it's very difficult to detect envelope um, antibodies for whatever reason, so they often spike the envelope in order to pull the reactivity. So we did the same thing in this study, and what you see is plasma from these infected patients are reactive to multiple XMRV proteins. And this is quite interesting because I show you the difference between patients 2112 2152 and 2231, where they react not only to that recombinant envelope, but to P30 and P12. And you can see in the pure virus alone, you can see reactivity to P30 and P12, but not to envelope um, protein in the pure viral lysate. Um, however, when we spike in the recombinant, you can see both the recombinant and the spike. Now, it, this patient, in contrast, 2111, has a, a very high signal for the GP anti envelope reactivity both in the just the purified virus and the combined. And that, that broad band suggests that maybe it's related to a glycosylated protein. So we're actually doing plasmapheresis on that patient to see that might be a very good reagent to use um, in, in validating some of these tests. So um, we, we use Next, we looked at transmission because we needed an infectious assay because it's difficult to detect infectious XMRV in the blood. So we had done this assay in, um, in the paper where we cultured with the indicator LENCAP cells um, the plasma or activated PBMCs, and we cultured them for 21 uh, to 42 days and then performed a Western blot just with the hypothesis that there were very low levels of the virus. This cell line responds to IL-6 estrogens, androgen, and is, is it defective in both the RNA cell and the um, entire JAK stat inter type 1 interferon pathway. So it allows the expression of very very high levels of, 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 of XMRV if, if you um, can have any um, at all, you'll amplify it below 10 copies. So currently in development, we, we're developing a what we call the Dursi cell line, and this is done by um, Vineet Kewal Ramani in the NCI. And what he's done here are, is they've disrupted the GFP um, in the cell line such that the mixed populations of either XMRV or, or other replication competent MLVs have to rescue that construct, that vector, and, and package it and infect a different cell line, and it's expressed. It has to have reverse transcriptase and integrase, and you can see it fluorescently um, either by flow cytometry on, or on a fluorescent microscope. So we used all of these techniques then to look at various cohorts, now more than seven cohorts around um, the world actually, and I just show the example of one. And here we isolated <coughs> it, it, infectious XMRV, and we detected the antibodies to XMRV by the techniques I showed you in the plasma of a cohort from the UK. And importantly, this cohort was selected with that strict criteria for illness, um, definitely meeting the, the uh, Canadian consensus criteria, but these patients were largely homebound, if not bedridden. The blood was collected by an independent phlebotomist in or near their home. So when Okay, so when we did the concordance of the infectious virus shown schematically, we could um, isolate the virus and show antibodies in more than 65% of these patients, see, reflecting the numbers we see uh, both in our study and the low alter study. So the method of patient selection very much influences the frequency of detection. So then in summary, we've shown we can detect XMRV footprints in the blood by serology and nucleic acid. The footprints were detected in several disparate geographic locations in the U.S. and Europe. Um, the XMRV-infected individuals express 
inflammatory cytokine signatures or cytokine profiles characteristic of inflammatory process and the sequence data indicate there are different strains of gamma retroviruses that human gamma retroviruses that can infect humans importantly the 22 RV1 cell line was never in a WPI lab nor is there any evidence of contamination of any kind in either the low or Lombardi studies so we conclude that the assays that detect all strains of human gamma retroviruses in the blood supply are presently the best. More full-length sequencing is definitely needed. We have only six full-length sequences and very few gag and envelope sequences in the gene bank. So the pathogenic potential of HGRVs in CFS and prostate cancer and, in fact, other disease deserves further expo exploration. So I'll thank my collaborators and take questions. Time for a few questions. Lenny. Thank you, Judy. This has certainly been um, a controversial area of, of, of research. And I'm just wondering if, Judy, you might be willing to comment on why do you think there's so many groups that have not been able to find these types of um, outcomes that you're talking about? And what are the major methodological issues that possibly confront these discrepant findings? Uh, sure. That's um, the first one is the, is the patient selection in the er, in the first negative studies that came out, and in fact, all of them. A lot of people are using samples where they don't know, and as we heard from you, Lenny, and from and Tony, they're they're really not diagnosed the same way. So you're looking at heterogeneity and and really trying to find a needle in a haystack, as it were, with the lower level expression. Um, second, um, we we don't. The, the basis of the paper isn't PCR. A lot of the groups are trying to do PCR with a qPCR that's focused on specificity to the what, it was, what was made the reference clones called VP62. And so because our initial sequences in the, um, in the gene bank were so highly similar, everybody focused on specificity instead until Dr. Lowe recognized that the nested pro, pro, in our paper was actually, it's got an annealing temperature of 53, and it'll actually pick up everything even with the variation. So that the PCR methods, um, nobody's um, done the culture or the um, serology in as detailed a way. I do know the one paper that just came out on the serology um, did, used an antibody that um, would detect most uh, polytropic, xenotropic, and ecotropic virus, but it did not detect the friend family, which as we showed, S spleen focus forming virus is the friend family. So that paper also did an immune precipitation and didn't show that the antibody could actually immune precipitate. So it, it's complicated, but, but all of these things have to go into to comparing clinical isolates where there might be a lot more variation. And I didn't get to show you the hypermutation. We see a lot of hypermutation in primary sequences from the patients, um, the 6 to 8% in the peripheral blood. So you'll miss those. So there's a lot of things that go into it. I think we just need more research to, to sort it all out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judy. Hey, okay.